I think from the beginning of my career and even before that, I was involved in free speech issues as a high school student uh, trying to prevent censorship in my high school, all through college, law school. Uh, my life has been advocacy of free speech. All right. Now, I guess with, with current free speech issues, there is the issue of Professor Warren Churchill. How familiar are you with, with Mr. Churchill in terms of the controversy? Nobody would ever have heard of Ward Churchill but for the fact that he made these idiotic statements. He's not an academic who was otherwise well known or well thought of who has made controversial statements, unlike, for example, Noam Chomsky, who would be famous even if he hadn't made some of the absurd statements he's made about America and Israel and the world community. Churchill is known only for his ridiculous statements. Had he not made them, he'd be an obscure, failed academic. Now, you bring that up, do you think that's also the part of the media looking for something controversial that has propped him up to that level? Anybody can become a media figure if you make ridiculous statements. It's easy to get media attention if you're prepared to analogize um, uh, firemen and, and postal workers and people who died in 9-11 to uh, one of the worst Nazi war criminals in the world. It doesn't take a lot of talent in America to get your 15 minutes of infamy. Uh, Churchill has perhaps gotten 30 minutes because not only did he make that ridiculous, offensive, bigoted statement, but he's made several others as well. Now, from this, Ward Churchill has actually been invited to a number of speaking engagements on college campus. Can we argue that he's made even more than, than his own salary for the year from all this? What is the interest then if, if it's not just the bigoted statements that has such, made him such an interesting figure in academia? When I was a kid, there used to be uh, circuses you went to. And we no longer do this because it's deeply offensive. But there used to be freak shows uh, outside the circus. And you would see uh, the bearded woman and just horrible freaks. We don't do that anymore. We now instead invite these kinds of absurd people to campuses because students will come to listen to any bigot, anybody who's willing to make extreme statements uh, will attract students. And you can make a career today in academia um, just by coming onto campus and making an utter fool of yourself. And people will come and listen. And, and you can make the argument that these statements, though, have to have a certain political affiliation, that it's not something that you would normally associate with right-wing politics. If you are David Duke, you can get some um, attraction on college campuses too, but of course nobody would invite you. And the administration would ban you and the political correctness people would prevent you from appearing on campus. Even if you're former Prime Minister Ehud Barak or former Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, you cannot speak on certain campuses like Concordia University in Canada. Uh, you will be threatened with violence and the university will ban you from speaking on campus. But a war Churchill, he will be invited anywhere and protected no matter how many armed forces have to be used to protect him because left-wing extreme speech is much more welcome on campuses today than right-wing even moderate speech. Now the current situation with war Churchill is claims, charges um, were originally um, did he have a right to express this viewpoint? And the other thing was ethnic identity. Those two were dismissed. What has stuck is the issue of alleged plagiarism and academic fraud. Um, have you been following um, what's been going on with the C Review Board? And I was going to say, is, what do you think of those charges? First of all, Ward Churchill has the right to say anything he chooses to say. On any street corner in America, he can publish without censorship by using his own uh, Xerox machine or, or email. That's a very different question from whether universities should lower their standards by inviting an academic fraud like uh, a Ward Churchill to speak on their campuses and should pay him uh, for speaking on their campuses. Two very, very different issues. One, do you censor him? Of course not. Do you ban him? Of course not. Second, do you invite him? That's a question of standards. Uh, 
Would you invite somebody who made comparably absurd statements from the right? Probably not. If you would, then invite him. If you would not, then don't make a distinction based on right-left. The issues of uh, plagiarism, those get thrown around politically a lot. Norman Finkelstein has falsely accused me of plagiarism. He accused uh, many, many, many other people of similar academic sins. He accused me of not writing my book, The Case for Israel, because it was pro-Israel. We haven't heard Norman Finkelstein trying to deconstruct the writings of Ward Churchill because he likes Ward Churchill's writings. So he and Noam Chomsky have pressed Ward Churchill as great paragons of scholarship, notwithstanding serious charges of, of plagiarism. All charges of plagiarism should be thoroughly investigated. When Finkelstein leveled his charges against me, I immediately brought him to the attention of the university. The university appointed the former president of Harvard, Derek Bach, to invest, investigate the charges, and they were dismissed as utterly without any basis. There should be a similar evaluation of charges made against uh, Ward Churchill. Now, Ward Churchill's attorney, David Lane, has said that you know if the ruling is against them, they're going to take it to court by saying that these charges were brought up um, alongside the controversy of 9-11 essay, that they were never pressed by, um, by CU administration. They were brought before CU many times before, but CU never decided to act on that. Um, could there be an issue involved, um, even if the argument saying that this is a red herring? The argument is a plausible one. If, in fact, the content of a person's political views is what stimulates an investigation that leads to a legitimate conclusion of plagiarism, there is a plausible argument that if the same level of investigation weren't conducted against somebody who had different political views, uh, a state university might have to justify its conduct. Uh, on, the, on the subject of on the reference to A.L. Heichmann, on the subject of technocrats, um, first I should ask, have you, have you read the essay? Yes. Or just, okay. All right, then you know um, Churchill is taking um, a very radical approach in how he's um, made a comparison to at least to those who were involved in any financial activity in the World Trade Center as technocrats and comparing them to little Eichmann's, hence Adolf Eichmann. And I guess the first thing to ask is, is comparing them to Adolf Eichmann an appropriate analogy? If so, why or why not? Analogies to Nazism are never appropriate and people on all sides should stay away from making analogies to the deliberate and willful mass murder of six million Jews and uh, many, many millions of other civilians. Those analogies just are designed clearly to provoke and uh, to confront. They also begin to, begin to get close to the line of bigotry. Anytime you make an analogy between something relatively trivial and something as horrible as as the Holocaust. Whatever criticism one might direct at people who worked at the World Trade Center, to call them Eichmanns, uh, little Eichmanns, is the worst form of bigotry, the worst form of, uh, of uh, misinformation. It's educational malpractice. Um, and it should be debated and destroyed in the marketplace of ideas. Um, many similar and many stupid statements like this are made every day on college campuses, and the way to respond to them is to defeat them in the marketplace of ideas, to intellectually challenge them and show how ridiculous and hollow and bigoted they are. Do you think someone like that also has its place in academia, where a person such as Churchill, whether tenured or non-tenured, would be free to, to make these statements without repercussions? Tenure gives you the right to be wrong, the right to be a fool, the right to make a fool of yourself so long as you don't impose your views on your students, as long as your students have the right to respond, to boo, uh, to expose you as a, a charlatan, a fraud, and uh, to attack you for what you said. So uh, the question is really always a complex one in academia. Would I ever dream of giving tenure to a war, Churchill? I can't imagine how he got tenure. To me, it was the worst kind of academic malpractice. What has he ever written? that's in any way tenurable, but then having made the mistake of granting him tenure, to fire him because of an absurd statement would violate academic freedom. Well, getting on to the subject of, of academic and freedom and free speech is War Churchill's um, own record uh, on this issue. Uh, in terms of, he already has a history of uh, using the, what I should say, the Bill of Rights, particularly the Ninth Amendment, as his excuse for why you should suppress the First Amendment for things that are considered to be offensive, undignified. And I'll give you an, an example here. This was shown on C-SPAN. He made the statement to 
an individual uh, at the very time he made his, his first um, uh, his first audience appearance, and he told that student that um, no, you don't have a right to celebrate Columbus Day. If you did, um, it should be criminalized, and people who do celebrate it, um, that would be a violation of the Ninth Amendment. But I'd like to quickly mention this because you can an attorney, I would, I'd like to find if there's any attorney that can find either a case known or a situation known that I can be argued with. Um, basically, it's this. Uh, you, without going to the Ninth Amendment, uh, he mentions about the inherency of human rights, and of course, rights not necessarily in the Constitution doesn't mean that they're not guaranteed to the people. Uh, what he says is this, is that uh, his Ninth Amendment rights make Columbus Day celebrations unconstitutional, a violation of human rights, and that all celebrations of Columbus and Columbus Day should not just be outlawed and banned, but even criminalized. And again, this was on tape. Mm -hmm. uh, now, my question is this, is he cites the Ninth Amendment as his legal grounds. Even his own attorney cites the Ninth Amendment as legal grounds. He's protested Columbus Day many times, exercising civil disobedience. The question is, do you know of any legal precedents for, for this? The Ninth Amendment bears absolutely no relationship to how uh, Churchill and his lawyer cite it. It uh, is utterly and completely irrelevant. It was not the intention of the Ninth Amendment. No court has construed it. That way it would be absurd to conclude that a country does not have the right to uh, celebrate or an individual doesn't have the right to celebrate. Even if a country decided it would no longer celebrate Columbus Day, any individual would have the right to do so and to criminalize it would be clearly a violation of the First Amendment, freedom of expression and freedom of speech. Ward Churchill is the perfect example of free speech for me, but not for thee. If he likes the speech, it's perfectly protected by the Constitution. If he doesn't like it, then it's prohibited by the Constitution. And yet, people as distinguished as Noam Chomsky have described Ward Churchill as a great scholar. Great scholar because he agrees with Chomsky on his radical critique of the United States and of Israel and of other uh, countries in the world that support democracy. Now, there's one thing we, we talked with Noam Chomsky before, and I'm sure you're aware, and I, I pressed him on the issue of back on earlier, he, he stood up for the right of, um, uh, I believe it was a German professor teaching in Frank, the Frank, 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 Frank. Yes. Uh, and even though he stood up for the principle of free speech, he wants to make a point of disassociating himself from the speech. Um, he did not want to do that for Lord Churchill, thinking that people shouldn't have to do it, just like the American Civil Liberties Union that has said that um, you know, it's this right to free speech and we're not going to take a stand on it. Today, is there some type of moral responsibility that people need to exercise that do stand up for the rights? Let me be very clear that Noam Chomsky did not disassociate himself ever from uh, Robert Forisson's Holocaust denial and anti-Semitic bigotry. In fact, he defended not only Forisson's right to express his anti-Semitic bigotry, but he said he saw no anti-Semitic implications in denying the Holocaust he described uh, Forasan as having done extensive research. He described him as a, quote, sort of apolitical liberal. He went well beyond what any civil libertarian uh, would do. Uh, uh, and he essentially, uh, by allowing an essay he wrote to be used as an introduction to Forasan's book, associated himself with the content of Forasan's writings. He's gone much further with Ward Churchill. With Ward Churchill, he's actually called him a, a good scholar and he has implicitly associated himself with uh, War Churchill statements. I don't think Chomsky would be stupid enough to use the term Little Eichmann's, but he has certainly used terms and phrases that would make you think that he agrees with the essential thrust of War Churchill's bigotry. Now I'd like to bring that over to the issue of academic freedom for both students and faculty on college campuses. We've interviewed Thomas Klochek, the, um, the professor who is now suing DePaul University, and what he's claiming now, there is a bigotry by a new group being involved, Muslim groups, that he's saying that they're being paired with the left and the far left now against the other group of classical liberals, centrist conservatives, and Jews. Um, how does this come to place? Is this a rationale for now um, Muslim militancy on some level is coming into the university environment? Uh, has this been around for a while and nobody's noticed? Or is, really, is, that, is that a rational statement? There is a new phenomenon. It started in France and in England. It's now moving to the United States where uh, Muslim extremists, many of whom do not favor free speech and do not favor civil liberties, are creating a coalition with American leftist radical extremists to promote pro-Islamic uh, speech and to forbid 
any speech that uh, is con perceived by radical Islamists as critical of their uh, perspective. The Paul University is the perfect example. Uh, they promote, celebrate, encourage the anti-Semitic speech of their own assistant professor, Norman Finkelstein, who has been fired by so many other universities and is now up to tenure at DePaul uh, University, notwithstanding the fact that uh, he has uh, a history of abusing students, a history of attacking people who don't agree with him. And at the same time, they fired uh, a very uh, distinguished and eminent uh, teacher who simply got into an argument with a group of Muslim students outside of class and because he allegedly offended them, suddenly he's lost his job. DePaul University cannot justify its double standard on the basis of uh, academic freedom. It clearly is saying we support the views of Finkelstein and we oppose the views of the pro-Israel professor who is not Jewish that uh, we have fired. Now there's been charges of Holocaust denial and a lot of Holocaust minimizers. Um, Ward Churchill and Norman Finkelstein have, have been accused of that. And with Ward Churchill, he's made the argument saying that there was never any deliberate attempt, that it was just by circumstance um, for um, the Jewish Holocaust. Uh, he said that it's the American Indian Holocaust that was a deliberate attempt by the U.S. government to eradicate Hitler. Have your comments on that? Ward Churchill comes very close to being a Holocaust denier. The Holocaust is defined as the willful, deliberate, purposeful murder of the Jewish population of Europe, a million children, uh, six million Jews altogether. To claim that it wasn't deliberate, that it was inadvertent, that they were just caught up in a, in a, uh, a war is Holocaust denial. So I think it's fair to categorize War Churchill uh, as within the camp of Holocaust deniers. Uh, Normal Finkelstein is a little bit more complicated. He is a Holocaust justice or Holocaust victim denier. He doesn't deny the Holocaust, but he denies that the living survivors of the Holocaust are actual survivors. He disputes Elie Wiesel's uh, life accounts. He disputes his own mother's uh, account of uh, her own uh, survival. Uh, which is worse? A Holocaust survivor in Canada told me recently that he thought Norman Finkelstein was worse because he denies the living, whereas people like Ward Churchill denied the dead. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Um, I spent a little bit of time on the CU campus engaging uh, some of Ward Churchill students and also administrative uh, folks, uh, the Chancellor De Stefano, as well as some of the regents. Um, and some interesting items came out of all of that. So I, my questions have to do with what the students were, were kind of talking about. And one of, it has to, one of the questions has to do with um, liberal versus leftist. And we see in journalism and many um, uh, professionals talking about almost interchangeably leftists, liberals. Do you see that? And can you comment on that? I am very anti-radical left. I am a conventional standard liberal, civil libertarian liberal, and my strongest enemies are the radical left. So there is clearly no association between liberals on the one hand and the kind of Stalinist hard left on the other hand. War Churchill represents the Stalinist hard left, Noam Chomsky the Stalinist hard left, Norman Finkelstein. Uh, liberals are, you know, the Ted Kennedy uh, part of the Democratic Party in favor of social reform, in favor of equal rights, in favor of free speech for all, not just for some. Liberals are being squeezed out of many American college campuses today. As a liberal, I'm called a conservative by the hard left, and I'm demonized uh, by the European press as being part of kind of the Bush, Wolfowitz, uh, right wing. Um, that's, of course, totally inaccurate. I'm a liberal cabal. Democrat, right? right? Well, and the cabal tends to have also names ending in Witzenberg, sure. and uh, it's a Jewish cabal as well. Um, but I'm a, you know, a standard traditional liberal Democrat, and that position on many academic uh, centers today is, is becoming squeezed out. You're either uh, hard left or right, and uh, it's very important to maintain a centrist, liberal, civil libertarian, open tradition on university campuses. We see many protests out there, reports of protests, where you'll have, for instance, International Answer, uh, you know, communist group, that sort of thing, and also uh, you know, the black bloc, if you will, where you have anarchist groups that are kind of working towards the same goal, I suppose. I'm not sure quite what it is or how they plan to pull it off. But um, my, my thinking is that uh, we have liberal, in today's lexicon, liberal plus um, leftist equals progressive in many 
is fascinating. Um, but then I wonder what leftists plus anarchists might. I, I'm not an expert on that area. I can tell you this, that what the right, the hard right, and the hard left have in common is often a hatred for Israel and a hatred for Jews. If you look at Pat Buchanan's new magazine, Conservative, um, it lauds people like Norman Finkelstein uh, because of their hatred of Israel and their hatred uh, of, uh, of Jews. So uh, Jews are once again on college campuses caught between the black and the red, uh, the black of extreme right-wing isolationist Pat Buchanan type conservatism and the red of the Chomsky, Finkelstein, uh, Ward Churchill, extreme leftism. Um, the Academic Bill of Rights uh, proposed by David Horowitz, lots of controversy over that. Um, this has gained considerable influence mm -hmm. in Congress and has already been passed by the Colorado State mm -hmm. Legislature. So I want to ask, what are your thoughts on this bill? Do you think this is a reaction to colleges not doing, not considering the job of any type of self-policing or responsibility? I would rather see Congress stay out of the area of uh, monitoring what goes on on college campuses. I think private organizations like FIRE, which is a libertarian centrist organization which watches over campuses but from a private perspective, is safer and healthier than the idea of congressional oversight of uh, college uh, and university debates. So my preference would be strongly to see private non-governmental organizations uh, monitoring what I think is a very serious problem, the problem of political correctness censorship on many college campuses today. Is it, a, is it analogous to say that it's a, you know, on an elementary school playground when the kids are all playing good, you don't have any teachers out there. When they're not playing good and they're brawling, the teachers are all out there. So it's uh, outside influence coming in when there's not self-policing. What I'm worried about is uh, congressmen with no concern about universities just trying to pander to their constituencies and trying to throw professors out who are in any way controversial. Today it could be professors on the right, tomorrow it could be professors on the left, and you know, someday it could be professors in the middle, tomorrow it could be atheist professors, the day after tomorrow it could be religious professors. I just don't want uh, pandering congressmen to be standing over uh, universities. I grew up during the McCarthy period and I remember when congressional committees were investigating Brooklyn College where I was then a student and wondering whether it could be appropriately called the Little Red Schoolhouse and um, so when you grow up in a period of McCarthyism you develop an allergy to governmental control over what goes on in college campuses even if it's well intended. Last March, uh, Chancellor DeStefano at the University of Colorado issued a statement and in that statement he Okay, expressed. Um, uh, Chancellor Stefano expressed that uh, Ward Churchill's free speech was uh, untouchable. And basically, that whole thing was, was not an issue. Uh, my question is, because I agree, with, I agree with that, anybody should be able to stand on the street corner and yak their yak, but are they necessarily entitled to a, a university position, especially professorship? I can't imagine why anybody would want to hire a Ward Churchill to be a professor uh, or want to promote such a person to tenure. He has no a distinguished academic uh, record. Um, I can imagine some fifth-rate university wanting to have a celebrity uh, on their campus without regard to standards. But once he's uh, on the campus and once he has tenure, he does have uh, free speech and the only appropriate response is in the marketplace of ideas. And I think if War Churchill's ideas were exposed to a legitimate open market, they would end up in the dustbin of history where they belong. Has there been anything positive or good that you see from the War Churchill controversy? I don't see any positive or good growing out of the War Churchill controversy. War Churchill is not a uh, poster child for freedom of speech because he himself doesn't believe in freedom of speech. He's a fool. He's an ignoramus. He's a bigot. Um, have students. Uh, uh, rally around him uh, does nobody uh, any good. The best thing that could happen is for War Churchill to climb back under his rock and uh, write the kind of things that uh, the seven or eight bigots that surround him love when he says every university has a War Churchill. Usually they're smart enough not to garner the kind of attention uh, he gets and um, on balance, War Churchill has done no good for the country, he's done no good for Native Americans, he's done no good for the left, he's done no good for um, the world.